Celebrating 45 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, a look back at a salt of the earth story and a family business revived. In Southern Gardening, we're still in Brookhaven, Mississippi for a springtime display of color. Also, a special treat, a look back in time through the eyes of former Farm Week anchor Leighton Spann. And in our final feature, the Endangered Species Act, a howling success, maybe too much so. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Mike Russell. Good to have you with us again here on Farm Week. Zach is on assignment. This week, a features show in our first segment, ag businesses often get handed down, but the dreams of descendants can take the original business idea off course. By the time the family's later generations come along, the original operation might need spicing up or the dream dies altogether. In this story by Peter Tubbs, a brother and sister went back to the proverbial salt mines to reboot a dormant business. The 400 million year journey of this artisanal salt ends at a pair of tweezers. Impurities and debris are meticulously pulled from the product before packaging at the J.Q. Dickinson Salt Works in Kanawha County, West Virginia. Um, it's been an amazing personal and professional journey to bring back this business um, for my brother and myself. And we really, um, you feel the weight of those seven generations kind of watching you. Nancy Bruns is the seventh generation of her family to make salt in the Kanawha River Valley. The family business began in the early 1800s by boiling water drawn from the ancient Lapidus Ocean. Sitting 300 feet below the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia, the 400 million year old brine is pumped into pools covered by hoop barns and dried using energy from the sun. The trip from brine to jar takes five weeks with the brine being dried three times. The salt gathered by hand and the salt crystals sorted and sifted into different sizes for packaging. The Bruns family has been exploring new markets for their product and taken advantage of the growing interest in specialty foods. Consumers and chefs around the country really wanted locally made high quality products. Uh, the so-called farm to table movement as well as um, there are very few salt makers in the U.S. who make it by natural evaporation, solar evaporation, and I saw a real opportunity there. The salt industry thrived in this corner of West Virginia in the 19th century and was the state's biggest consumer of coal before the Civil War. Pork processors in Cincinnati were the primary destination of salt from the Kanawha River Valley. Production of salt from West Virginia declined in the years after World War II as underground salt mining became more economical. The Dickinson family moved into mineral extracts to keep the company afloat until the 1980s. Nancy and her brother Lewis revived the family business by targeting specialty foods in 2013. It's a really bright, bold flavor. You actually end up using less because it's a strong flavored salt. And the texture of it is very unique. It's not hard like rock salt and it's not soft and flaky. It's got a nice crunch, but it's a delicate crunch and it really adds a nice pop of flavor in your food that's unlike any other salt in the world. The flavor and crunch found a fan base among chefs and food lovers across the country. The market is split between wholesale and retail customers and consumers can purchase directly from the company. Sales have increased at the same rate that production has expanded. The initial 400 pound test harvest has grown to an annual production of over 20,000 pounds of salt. The only limits to output are the number of sunny days in the Kanawha Valley between March and October. Their over-the-counter business sees many of the same challenges faced by other niche food marketers, including the need to convince customers to pay a price premium for an otherwise readily available product. Once people understand that a naturally made sea salt is better for you, the mineral content is good for you, and the difference in the flavor it makes on your food, they don't go back. So if you can just get it in their hands and in their kitchens, they're really uh, loving it and they don't turn back to the, the big guys. To greater diversify their marketing plan, 
J.Q. Dickinson Saltworks is also a popular event space for weddings and gatherings, providing revenue when the business would otherwise be closed. The company also hosts a monthly dinner series with regional chefs that support local nonprofits and a salt festival in September. Overall, reviving a business created by earlier generations has been a rewarding second career for the siblings. And here we are on the same land where they made salt for so many years, and it's, it's an unbelievable experience. And even though we're doing it very, very differently than they did it, it's, it's actually something that's brought our larger family together because we have this joint history and now it's alive again. On the lighter side in this week's Southern Gardening, we're still in Brookhaven, Mississippi for a springtime display of color and landscape variety. Today, Gary Bachman is all about native flowering shrubs like the camellia and azalea. Here's Gary with why they're so popular. Southern Gardening is visiting Woodley in Brookhaven. Among the plantings of camellias and azaleas are some prized Mississippi native flowering shrubs. Let's take a look. A group of spring flowering native shrubs that are truly loved are the native azaleas. I really love Rhododendron ostrinum, the Florida flame azalea, which has the adorable common name honeysuckle azalea. This plant has flowers ranging from yellow to fiery orange. The flowers can be up to one and a half inches across, but it's the way the stamens and pistil extend out of the flower that I find most attractive. An old native tree that flowers in late spring is the white fringe tree. My favorite common name for this tree sounds a little wizardly, Grancy Greybeard. Botanically speaking, Grancy Greybeard is Chianthus virginicus. The name Chianthus comes from the Greek words meaning snow flower. And you can see why because Grancy Greybeard produces glistening white, fringe-like flowers by the thousands. Our last native is the red buckeye, the Aesculus pavia. This is a small deciduous tree or shrub that thrives in the partial shade. In the spring, tubular red flowers appear on six to eight inch upright clusters. The flowers are a signal that the hummingbirds will soon be arriving the palmate foliage is attractive. Native flowering shrubs can add interest to any landscape. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardens. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up at our Farm Week feature, it's an ecological success story, but not everybody's happy. 50 years ago, wolves had all but disappeared, but the Endangered Species Act led to a comeback and ultimately to a common battle, ranchers versus wolves. Some say it's time to take wolves off the list and let ranchers help with population control, but the law says otherwise. A no-win situation? We look closer, coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education of which extension work is an essential part is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination and leadership. That these are the keys to democracy and that people when given facts they understand will act not only in their self-interest, but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. 
believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home, that my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. And now a little time travel piece, a story we ran last year and which got a big response. And timely with the release of this month's supply and demand report from the USDA coming up in a few days. 22 years ago, former Farm Week anchors Leighton Spann and artist Ford visited Washington, D.C., invited to participate in the release of the September numbers in 1999. As you'll see, it's an interesting process, and by the way, I've included a bit of the actual Farm Week broadcast from that show. Take a look. Tomorrow, as it does once each month, the USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service will release a crop production report as well as a report on world ag supply and demand estimates. When these reports were released last month on September 10th, Farm Week was on hand in Washington, D.C. at the invitation of state statistician Tommy Gregory. That trip to Washington to witness the release of the September reports is the subject of our feature tonight. Production forecasts for corn, wheat, cotton, soybeans, and other crops are defined by law as speculative because they are traded on commodity markets. Anyone having early access to this information would have an obvious advantage in trading. As we found out, keeping the contents of the reports confidential until their release gets almost as much attention as the actual preparation of the numbers. From the outside, it looks like any other Thursday afternoon at the USDA South Building in Washington, D.C. On the inside, though, it's obvious that preparations are underway for something important. A portion of the fifth floor hallway has been secured. Special steel doors like these are closed and locked to limit access by elevator as well as on foot. Opaque vinyl shades with steel reinforcers are drawn over each window in this area of the building and sealed. The USDA's National Ag Statistics Service, or NAS, is beginning a lockup to prepare and release a monthly crop production report and the world's supply and demand estimates. By 7 o'clock the next morning, as the nation's capital comes to life, the report's contents, production forecasts for corn, wheat, soybeans, cotton, and other crops have been finalized. We were allowed into the lockup area here on the fifth floor of the USDA South Building about one hour before release of the report, but USDA employees actually working on the numbers have been at it since midnight. Mississippi's Commissioner of Agriculture, Dr. Lester Spell, and a group of four county extension agents also arrive at the entrance to the lockup area before 7.30 to be in place to observe the official release of the reports. The group is admitted only after presenting proper credentials that were issued in advance. We enter through a double door closure in serpentine fashion, another aspect of the physical security that surrounds the crop numbers. That's so I couldn't stand down here and wave at somebody outside in the hallway. And it uh, works very effectively, as you can tell. A little inconvenient as you came through, especially with the group, but uh, it still works very well. Again, the whole idea behind the lockup approach is to prevent anyone from getting early access to the crop information and having an obvious advantage in trading. In a nearby room, also within the lockup area, a huge photocopier is churning out copies of the crop production report. The first copies of the report had to be available by 7 a.m. for members of the news media. The media are allowed into this special room within the lockup area and given a copy of the crop numbers an hour and a half before the scheduled release time. This allows the reporters for organizations such as Reuters, Bloomberg, and the Wall Street Journal to have their stories and tables on the crop report prepared by the official release time of 8.30 a.m. To ensure that the information stays within the media room and the lockup area until that hour, all telephone lines have been turned off and all pagers, cellular phones, and other communication devices have been surrendered. There's a clock in there on the wall which is hooked to the National Bureau of Standards and that's what we release the report by. At 829 I'm going to go in there and I'm going to tell them that they can turn on their equipment but not transmit 
And then at exactly 8.30, I'm going to say go, and within just a second, that stuff will be all around the world. Secretary of Agriculture Dan Glickman entered the lockup area on the fifth floor less than 10 minutes before the release time. Not even Glickman, the USDA's top administrator, knew the contents of the report in advance. I sign it before I read it. He so. signs it before he reads it. The report is not considered official and thus cannot be officially released out of the lockup area until Dan Glickman or an Undersecretary of Agriculture signs it. Back down the hallway in the media room, Bill Pratt, the secretary of the Ag Statistics Board, turns the electronic switch, restoring telephone communications to the area just in time, 8.30 a.m. Go! The actual numbers and analysis of the crop production report and the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates are then released by reporters using computer modems, fax machines, and telephones. And within five minutes of the release time, the information is also available over the Internet from the National Ag Statistics Service homepage on the World Wide Web. The numbers in the report were hammered out in this room within the lockup area by the members of the Agricultural Statistics Board. Sitting around this conference table at built-in computer terminals, the board members began their work at midnight and spent about 30 minutes on each crop. The survey data they were reviewing on each crop in order to set the numbers had been transmitted to Washington by NASA's network of state statistical offices and kept on diskettes in a safe until this day. State statisticians use a combination of crop enumerators, personnel who actually visit fields and make ground observations of crops, as well as telephone calls to farmers to put together the data. Mississippi statistician Tommy Gregory says although the reference date on their report is September 1st, the sheer size of the information gathering process requires that it be spread out a few days before and after that date. The objective yield count started on the 25th of August. We had enumerators were out in, in 170 fields across Mississippi. Uh, telephone calls to individual farmers started right after s September 1. For the four Mississippi County Extension agents who observed the release of the September 1999 crop report, there is a greater appreciation now for the importance of providing accurate statistical information. So it kind of lets me know what I do in the county in terms of ag statistical reporting, let me know how important it is and how it's all being used. And also it brings a more of a global perspective too into the data and the uh, outcomes. From Washington, D.C., I'm Leighton Spann reporting. Very, well, Leighton, very informative for us as well as our viewers. I was I fortunate enough to go along with you and did the photography work on your story, and it was. Uh, the secrecy, the, the, the attention to detail, they really don't want the numbers to get out. One of the things when I asked them, I said, well, how do you keep perspective in that the numbers and the reports you're working with you know, they affect people all over the world. And he said, well, he says, we, we try to maintain fairness, that nobody gets a first crack at these numbers and that it comes out and everyone has, to, has the same ability to react at the same time. But again, basically they're working from midnight to dawn to compile this report. They put in the midnight oil the night before that report. That was actually 23 years ago. Ernest is right, though. There's a lot of work that goes into that supply and demand report. And starting this month, even more work with new changes the USDA is making. Typical report is around 40 pages long. Finally, 30 years ago, I reported on a project in Colorado called Mission Wolf, working to reintroduce wolves to the wild. So I'm particularly interested in this next story. Wolves came close to extinction years ago, but it's a different story now and one with people on both sides of how to manage the species, including ranchers who want to protect their farm animals. Colleen Bradford Krantz has more. Once upon a time, there were two groups of predators who constantly fought over the same prey. They battled one another for generations until finally one pushed the other out. Over time, the winning predators began to miss their enemy. Some helped their former rivals return to the once contested forest and fields. And now, it only remains to be seen if they can live side by side. While it may not read like an old storybook, Michigan wildlife biologist Brian Roll keeps a list on his computer of important wolf dates. We actually, throughout the early um, 1900s, you know, kill every wolf you see. They were a bounty animal. 
you know, all the way up to 1956, we felt there was probably fewer than 100 wolves in the Upper Peninsula. And just four years later, the whole um, bounty was actually removed from the state of Michigan. By the end of the 1960s, gray wolves had all but disappeared from the region, with one small pocket remaining in northeast Minnesota's Iron Range. In 1966, wolves were listed under the precursor to the Endangered Species Act. As things changed, um, both ecologically and socially, people started to realize that predators were a large and uh, an important part of an ecosystem. By the 1980s, wolf populations began to rebound across Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Roll says exceeding planned population goals should have resulted in wolves being removed from the endangered species list. Instead, a series of administrative changes in answering lawsuits have meant the wolf status on the list in Michigan has whipsawed, changing seven times in an 11-year period. So it's been this yo-yo movement that I don't think has helped wolves. All it does is build this animosity that we can't do anything. We can't protect our own livestock. We can't protect our pets. Roll says when those lawsuits succeed, the rare wolf found hunting lambs or calves can only be dealt with through non-lethal means. Nearly all of those measures eventually stop being effective. If we could empower the farmer to do some of those some of that work it grants wolves you know some some approval rating that we i can deal with that but when they're this hands off that even though they're killing cattle i'm not allowed to kill that wolf that creates the animosity and then and what what they do is they tell their neighbor their neighbor tells their buddy and then it just snowballs and so people have this belief that you know, wolves are rampantly killing livestock, which isn't the case. 250 miles away in Minnesota, wolf numbers are climbing and territory is expanding. The state estimates the wolf population now numbers more than 2,800, about two-thirds of the total in the western Great Lakes region. One research team is getting up close and personal in Voyagers National Park near International Falls, Minnesota. Their trail camera footage has helped draw attention to the wolves' gradual return. Unlike in Michigan and Wisconsin, wolves in Minnesota are listed as threatened rather than endangered. This allows government officials to use the last resort option of killing a wolf known to be causing repeated problems with livestock. When wolves are causing problems by eating sheep or eating cattle or hunting dogs or pets, um, which they've been documented to do, no one wins, right? Uh, it's a problem for, for the owners of those animals. It can be an economic problem. Wolves don't win because often USDA Wildlife Services will come in and trap, lethally remove wolves as well to mitigate that conflict. So I, I think everyone has a shared interest to, to minimize that. Wildlife experts have a range of non-lethal options including guard animals such as dogs, donkeys, and llamas. If those fail, streamers, lights, and alarms could be used to frighten wolves. But none of these work every time. You have folks who, who raise livestock who think the only wolf, good wolf is a dead wolf, and you have folks who absolutely enjoy and are thrilled by wolves on the landscape where they're operating. Cattle producer Keith Carlson is learning to coexist with the wolves, which have returned to his sandstone Minnesota farm about an hour south of Duluth. As a, a youngster growing up, well, if we ever heard of or seen a wolf, it was very, very rare. It was probably in the past 20 years or less that uh, we've started to have to deal with wolves that are uh, in this area. There, there's many producers or ranchers throughout this area that have had wolf problems the past, within the past 10 years, it seems to have gotten even worse. Carlson says the challenges are offset a bit by government reimbursement for livestock killed by wolves. However, the evidence must be clear that a wolf was responsible. Last summer on, on our ranch, we had five confirmed wolf kills, and I'm saying we had eight, but we couldn't prove the other three. But we do have 
agencies that work well with us helped verify that it was a wolf kill. Carlson says Midwest residents are being misled when a population goal is met but doesn't result in delisting. They all came to an agreement, which that's kind of what's frustrating for us. It, to me, it opens up attacking the whole Endangered Species Act. And I, I certainly don't want to see major changes made to the Endangered Species Act because of one species. When you, when you look at wolves in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, we it should be a celebration of the Endangered Species Act. Not used as a tool to keep them perpetually on the list. It's never an easy answer, that's for sure. Well, next week on the show, pulse crops, a protein source gaining in popularity. Over the last two years, COVID helped push pulses like dry peas, lentils, and chickpeas into the spotlight. They use less water and fertilizer, and the cost for a serving is a fraction of that for meat. We're in North Dakota, where one producer says it's a volatile market, but worth the risk. Pulse crops gaining ground next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. See you next week. Thanks for watching.